The Bitcoin Standard Podcast brings you seminars from safedean.com, my independent online learning platform where you can take my online courses on the economics of Bitcoin and economics in the Austrian school tradition, join our two live weekly seminars, and read my books before they are published. Sign up now for access to the draft of my forthcoming economics textbook, Principles of Economics, and take five full online courses based on my books, The Bitcoin Standard, The Fiat Standard, and Principles of Economics. The Bitcoin Standard Podcast is brought to you by Crowd Health. Crowd Health is the Bitcoiner's answer to fiat health insurance. If you listen to the show, you've probably heard me rail against the problems of modern healthcare and health insurance. Crowd Health is a brilliant new solution to this problem that leverages the power of Bitcoin to help people get affordable healthcare. Crowd Health holds its cash reserves in Bitcoin. It negotiates with healthcare providers on your behalf and gets you much better rates by offering to pay them cash upfront without having to go through the expensive bureaucracy of modern healthcare insurance. It's a solution that works better for healthcare providers and for patients by disintermediating large insurance companies who have the wrong incentives and are constantly raising costs. I'm very happy to have signed up for Crowd Health and I'm really excited to support them as they disrupt the fiat health insurance industry. Go to joincrowdhealth.com and use the discount code SAFE, S-A-I-F, and you'll get the first six months for $99 only. Coinbits. Coinbits is a great way to introduce your pre-coiner friends and family to Bitcoin. Get them set up in under a minute and help kickstart their journey by turning every day's pair change into Bitcoin. This Bitcoin-only app takes the uncertainty and fear out of Bitcoin saving by rounding up debit and credit card purchases to the nearest dollar, then using the difference to buy Bitcoin. Set it, forget it, and let the app automatically tax your high-time preference spending by saving the hardest money ever. Want to save in Bitcoin faster? Customers can multiply their roundups up to 10x or adjust their savings frequency for weekly or daily Bitcoin stacking. Coinbits is built on a sound, tried and true dollar cost averaging strategy that turns Bitcoin's volatility in your favor. Once you've gotten a private wallet set up, Coinbits encourages you to withdraw your Bitcoin to your own private wallet and embrace the Bitcoin standard way of life. Start stacking on coinbitsapp.com and save your time and energy in the soundest money ever. The Bitcoin Standard Podcast is brought to you by CoinKite. CoinKite are my favorite makers of Bitcoin hardware. They produce the legendary Open Dime, the first Bitcoin bearer asset, as well as the reliable cold card hardware wallet, the excellent stainless steel seed plates for storing your seed phrases, and the block clock. Now, CoinKite have produced the SATS card, a card the size of a credit card which can store Bitcoin and works great as a gift. CoinKite have just produced a limited edition gorgeous Bitcoin standard SATS card, which carries the Bitcoin standard logo, and you can get it from coinkite.shop slash Bitcoin standard. Use the code Bitcoin standard to get 5% off your purchase. Get paid in Bitcoin regardless of who you work for and regardless of who is paying you. All thanks to a premium service I personally love and use, and that is Bitwage. Thanks to Bitwage, I receive my books royalties in Bitcoin. It is cheaper, faster, and easier. It is a true set it and forget it system, and Bitwage has been offering this premium service since 2014. Anyone can sign up and use it right away. No restrictions or limits, fully non-custodial. You can even split your incoming payment, get part in Bitcoin and part to a bank account you specify. It could not be easier and I cannot recommend Bitwage highly enough. Go to bitwage.com and sign up now and get paid in Bitcoin with your next payment or salary. Hello, welcome to another episode of the Bitcoin Standard Podcast. Our guest today is Jonathan Chester. Jonathan is the co-founder and CEO of Bitwage, the leading provider of Bitcoin payroll, invoicing, and benefits. I use Bitwage myself, and they are one of the sponsors of this podcast, and I highly recommend using it. Bitwage was founded in 2014 and has processed over $200 million in transactions with over 2,000 registered companies. Jonathan was previously the first contributor on Forbes for all things Bitcoin and blockchain related in the entrepreneurship section. Jonathan has also been featured in Entrepreneur Magazine, CNN, Coindesk TV, and he consulted members of the European Parliament regarding regulation of the blockchain industry, Dutch banks and regulators at the Amsterdam Institute of Finance. He has keynoted Orange's biannual corporate summit and spoken at conferences such as Ferris, FinTech Forum, Viva Technology, Transact15 and Bitcoin22. Jonathan, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you so much for, for having me. So as we usually like to on this podcast, we like to begin by um, discussing people's uh, path toward Bitcoin. The vast majority of people are still not Bitcoiners. So there's always something interesting that makes somebody become a Bitcoiner. So how did you chance upon this world and what drove you here? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I, I, I chance upon this world uh, purely through um, a desire to to grow. You know, I was I was working I was working at Oracle back in 2013, and I wasn't I wasn't very happy where I was being this, in this giant machine. So I said, okay, well, you know, to 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 find something that I'm passionate about, let's learn every single day about something new. And during that time, I came across a TED Talk. Uh, that was talking about the future of money. And Bitcoin was just one of the things that had been mentioned. And I immediately became enamored um, around, you know, financial sovereignty, being your own bank, uh, more efficient cross-border transactions, uh, banking the unbank. So I decided, okay, let's, let's, let's go down this rabbit hole. About a month later, I came out this obsessed Bitcoin guy. Right, so I'm 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 going around at Oracle telling people you gotta buy Bitcoin, you gotta buy Bitcoin, and this was I think it was 2013. So there was this huge, there was this big run up from like $200 to $1,000 that was that was happening, and so you know I felt I felt very self assured that I that that I was telling telling people the 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 right thing. Of course, a lot of them bought at like the top of this bubble, which was like $1,000. It all crashed, and they were they were upset for 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 quite a long time. Um, But those who held, obviously. Uh, lo- love me now. <laughs> um, that's kind of how I went down that path, and I-, I just started thinking about, you know, the Bitcoin ecosystem, how it's going to be uh, taking over our, our our financial system. And the way I ended up getting to Bitwage was I was looking at how Bitcoin exists, right? And at the time, there were merchant processors, there were wallets, there were exchanges, and if you looked at the financial loop that existed there, you could as a user, buy Bitcoin on an exchange, store it on your wallet, spend it at a merchant. But at no point did that merchant who acquired that Bitcoin, were they able to actually uh, pay, use that Bitcoin to pay the employees back and essentially create a a full financial loop. And we thought, okay, well, let's, let's enable this. Let's make this happen, right? We want to enable Bitcoin to be its own financial ecosystem. And that's how I kind of went off and, and started Bitwage. And, you know, I think it was, it was, it was pretty funny because you, you just see people on, on like Reddit, r slash Bitcoin, which is like the place for news back in the day um, in, in, in 20, 2014, those times. And people would always be like, oh, but you can't get paid in Bitcoin. It's only going to be real when you can. And then they'd be like, but actually Bitwage now exists and you can't, right? <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's, I guess that's a little bit of our, our origin story. Yeah, and uh, so you started in 2014, and I think this is pretty early because at that point, very few people were uh, aware of Bitcoin even. I mean, yeah, the bubble in 2013 was kind of big news. It made it uh, to the front pages of most media and most of the world's consciousness. They heard about Bitcoin for a while, and then, of course, you know, everybody expected that it would crash, and of course, it did crash. And so by 2014, pretty much everything uh, had died down and everybody had felt vindicated that, yes, it did crash, that, yes, this was just a mania that was just going to go away. Um, how hard was it to do start something like this in 2014? Did you actually have any customers? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so let's see. I, 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 we, quit in, we quit our jobs in June and I think it took us like three or four months to get our first like company client. Right. And that's like a company signs up and then lets their employees get a part of their salary in Bitcoin. And, you know, before we quit our jobs, I was calling merchants, right, that were accepting, because, hey, would you pay your employees in Bitcoin if it was offered? And they were like, oh, yeah, sure. Why not? But when we actually offered the service, you know, they weren't, no, no one was biting. I think partially because of, you know, the whole Mt. Gox and Silk Road situation, right? Um, but we knew that people wanted to get paid part of their salary in Bitcoin. And so, what ended up happening was we created this service so that anyone, regardless of who their employer is, could receive part of their salary in Bitcoin, which is you know what what you use on our service, and that you know enabled us to exist, right? Um, but it, you know it was it was interesting. It took us a year and a half to actually raise our first round, and as you were saying, Bitcoin almost became this dirty word at that time. When you go into an investor meeting or you go into like a bank or, or, or whatever, you said the word Bitcoin, you know, they might, they might like look down on you or, or laugh you out of the room, right? Um, so I just, I remember going in, into, into bank discussions or, or investor discussions and say, uh, saying things like, oh yeah, like we're paying people internationally, 
using uh, blockchain value tokens, you know, to obfuscate the fact that, that, that we were using Bitcoin. Luckily, that all changed with 2017. All of a sudden, it was, it was, yeah. it was cool to use Bitcoin. But, you know, we had to, we had to sort of, you know, talk like that back then. Yeah, I think it's it, it's uh, it, it's very cyclical. Uh, you know, I've uh, been following the space for a while, and yeah, 2014 was a time when which Bitcoin had already died, and everybody felt vindicated. 2015, it was forgotten. 2016, it was only really you know a few diehards on the Twitter and Reddit who you know regrouped after the routing of 2014 and 15. Were still you know only only the most fanatic diehards were left, and then 2017. It goes back to being respectable again, and we go back to all of these very fancy buzzwords and all of the crypto industry uh, starts coming up with all of these um, amazing ways in which crypto is going to change everything, blockchain is going to change everything, blockchain technology, and 2017 was the ICO mania. And uh, so we go back to this kind of, oh, well, this is going to change everything. And then 2018, we go back to Bitcoin is dead, Bitcoin is... Uh, bad word and then 2019 is a little bit more of that 2020 starts off like that but it, you know it starts off by by the beginning of 2020 it's really only the diehards that are left and then 2021 michael saylor and naib bukele and uh, <laughs> we're back <laughs> to the top of the world and now 22 we're back to being a bad word i think looking back i think you know 2018 Bitcoin was not such a bad word as it is today or 2014. I think Mount hmm. Gox in 2014 and FTX in 2022 have really given Bitcoin a very bad name. And for most people now, you know, uh, we're getting this kind of absolutist. Bitcoin will never be anything. We're getting it again. Most of these people had sort of quieted down by 2018 and 2019. So even though Bitcoin crashed, you didn't get this kind of venomous reaction to it that you get today or that you got in 2014. Um, there was a little bit of uh, conservatism on the side of the haters. Like they, yes, they still hated Bitcoin, but they weren't as adamant that it was all dead, that it was all gone, that it was dead forever. I think this time it's a little bit more like 2014. You know, you're seeing like, you know, for instance, some of the, some of the you know for instance pomp who's made his name probably in bitcoin circles and got really a lot of attention among bitcoiners he's basically removed bitcoin from his uh, profile he removed his laser eyes and he's uh, not talking about bitcoin anymore oh, wow. uh, yeah it, but how did, how did that happen i i, I knew that he, he was he was uh, uh, pumping up in luna a little bit but to, to remove Bitcoin. Well, that's the thing, yeah. That's, uh... He was pumping Luna and he was pumping BlockFi and he was invested in BlockFi. Oh, and so I see. Th these kind of, uh, you know, Luna, BlockFi, FTX, um, Celsius, each one of these was a very bad experience for a lot of people. I mean, a lot of normal people lost all of their money on these uh, things and it left a very sour taste in the mouth of many, many people. It's why we're back to Bitcoin being a bad word. It's, it's, it's similar to 2014, I think, which you know sounds bad if you're concerned about today primarily, but I think it sounds good if you're concerned about tomorrow because from the way that I see it, <laughs> what's going to happen? There's still only 900 Bitcoins made every day. Nobody can make more. And uh, even if demand continues to drop, eventually the daily supply is going to drop by half in a couple of years. Not even a couple of years. It's like a year and four months now. We're going to get another halving and we're going to go on the same ride all over again. And, um, you know, all of this, uh, all of this angry <laughs> fist waving at the clouds is going to go the same way that all the previous fist waving is gone. <laughs> I mean, uh, there, there are two comments I, I, I want to make. The, the first is just, you know, how close is it to 2014? I mean, I still remember very viscerally in 2014 that Bitcoin was such, was such a dirty word that you, you, you had to stay away from it. Like you couldn't have like a serious conversation with people because there weren't people with lots of money who were so uh, uh, had so much conviction in it, right? Now, yeah. you're right. There's a lot of people who got burned, a lot of people who lost their conviction, but we still, it's still a magnitude greater of like the people who are still, you know, who still believe in this, who are still pushing it forward. I mean, if you just, if you look at the Bitcoin ecosystem today, even after the crash, there's just, 
a, a, a much wider range of people that are involved, that are committed, that are pushing it forward. And it's, you know, it, partially it's because of, of this community that, that we haven't gotten back to, you know, sort of this dark ages of, of Bitcoin, yeah. you might say. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it is it is a dark age, but it's uh, 100x higher. And that's really the whole point. Like, yeah. the, the, we've, it was at that point, it was $200. And if you told anybody that it was going to be at $20,000, they would have thought you're crazy. And here we are eight years later, it's the end of the world again, same sentiment as we had back then. But we're 100 times higher. It's $17,000 right now. It was 170 back then in the end of 2015, I think. So seven years on, uh, we're 100x higher. We've got Sailor on board. We've got El Salvador. We have large financial institutions that are holding Bitcoin. We've got all these um, very rich people that, have, you know, we have Bill Miller and Stan Druckenmiller all uh, um, saying that they're into Bitcoin. And it's a hundred times higher, but you know people still <laughs> can. If if you want to hate, you can still find the ammo for your hate because oh well, it's down from its all time high, and so it's gone, it's dead. If you keep a long term perspective, you see that it's just the same thing. It just keeps getting, it just keeps repeating with a ten x every four years. Yeah, and, and ultimately the fundamentals are actually getting better. Oh, you know, every single year, right? Um, all the all the hype you know, that we see that caused the price to bubble is, you know, not affecting the fundamentals, but more nodes, more mining, more, well, more non-custodial wallets holding Bitcoin, right? Um, yeah. These are all the things that we like to see continuing to go up and we, and we do see that. There was one other point I wanted to mention, which was how, you know, in 20, 2017, we had all the like, crypto is going to save the world going on. Um, but it's interesting because I almost feel like every wave, they, they're saying the same thing, but applying a different, you know, uh, attempt of, of forking Bitcoin to it. So like in the 2015 era, it was, it was private blockchains, permission blockchains, right? There, there were some big groups like R3. R3, you know, I remember them. I was yeah. trying to do that. They raised like $100 million. I don't, I don't really know what they're doing anymore. But, and then, and then the ICO boom, it was the same thing. Supply chain, you know, digital identity, you know, all this stuff. And then, and then in the latest one, it's NFTs. You know, and they're all saying that these technologies are going to enable these things, right? And so probably in the next bubble, we're going to find another thing, right? It'll be yeah. like, you know, it'll be like, you know, metaver metaverses are going to, you know, do 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 all this do all this stuff, or who who even knows, right? And, and at the end of the day, it's just it it, it it it's just a giant giant money grab for 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 all these people, but. Um, yeah, it's like yeah. If you, it's it, it, it takes a lot of stoicism and a lot of control of your emotions to just accept Bitcoin for what it is and not to get carried away, which is really what happens for most people, particularly people who consume mainstream media, not to get carried away when there's a drop in price to believe, all right, this is gone, this is dead, Rubini is right, um, <laughs> this is all stupid, this was all a big scam, it's all money laundering, it's all criminals all the way down. And then when there's a small rise up, to not get carried away the other way around and just fall for whatever buzzword comes along. No, JPEG receipts are not going to revolutionize the world. They're not going to save anything. The fact that you can add a receipt for a JPEG is not a big deal. But, you know, when Bitcoin goes up, people are just so excited and then their imagination runs wild. And so these emotional extremes to be able to regulate your emotions where that, you know, it's gone up over the all time low, over the three year low. It's gone up 50% over the three year low, you know, uh, doesn't mean <laughs> that all of the, everything we know about economics and technology and all the world's institutions have become invalid now. And it doesn't mean that we're gonna, you know, remember in 2017, we're going to get rid of the stock market because we now have ICOs. <laughs> we're going to get rid of companies because we could just have blockchain. Remember people like Naval saying, uh, uh, what was this? There was that famous, <laughs> almost like a parody tweet of himself, which was, uh, blockchains will replace uh, will replace companies by code or something like that. Like the, mm. the the entire idea of people working together in a firm is going to be obsoleted because we have blockchains. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, ultimately, but let's see. It's like DAOs. DAOs don't even remove people from companies. They just you know enable you to have some. You know, think you have like a, a, a an equity arbitrage, right? Uh, or a, a, a secure a, a re an arbitrage against securities regulation, right? That's the problem with all this stuff, right? Is that you know with IC with, with, with these ICO tokens, all, at the end of the day, they're all just securities, right? 
You know, th- 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 there's no re- no one actually buys an ICO token thinking I bought this to use this. They always thought I'm buying this because I believe this is going to go up in value, right? That's that's you know 99% of the use cases of all this. So at the end of the day, they're all just unregistered securities, right? Unregulated, unregistered securities. You can also think about the same thing with what's happening in DeFi. All all all. all all the stuff that was happening here is you had unregulated banking activity occurring, right? They were saying, hey, give, give risklessly deposit your money with us and we're just going to take it and loan it out to people, um, but we're, we have no regulation. So we're going to take wildly riskier bets with your money and tell you that, that you, you, you have a riskless deposit, right? This is um, 100%, right? That what, what was happening here. Um, and it was funny because I think it was in during the, the 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 2020 boom, being in Clubhouse, hanging out with like Bitcoin Tina, telling people like, just hold your Bitcoin. Like, wh- who cares if you can get five percent if you get end up with five percent of nothing? And it's just you know it's both terrible, but also you know like sort of shows almost like the value of Bitcoin maximalism in in a sense, right? You know, the, the, uh, I, I'm not, you know, uh, I'm not a, a toxic Bitcoin maximalist, but I like yet. toxic yet, yet, yet. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I have a, I, you know, I, I like these guys because they're, they're always saying the truth. The, may, maybe in a, in a sort of like a harsh, you know, a, a harsh way, but they're always saying the truth. And that's why I, I really like, like, you know, this group of people, if, you know, you can sort of stomach the, the 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 anger that comes out of them right <laughs> so, yeah yeah and i think you know obviously if you choose to get triggered by the anger you know you're choosing to find a reason to get triggered and avoid facing the content because um you know for every person being angry and toxic and saying mean things on the internet there's a hundred people making the same point in a polite articulate way in books and podcasts and magazine articles and blog posts and all kinds of media but people you know uh, when you don't want to listen to the message you find the message that is formulated in a way that you don't like and then you fixate on it and so we see this weird obsession with trying to police uh, the speech of bitcoiners you shouldn't say this you shouldn't say that and it's always coming from people who <laughs> want to promote the kind of things that blow up at people's faces like luna and celsius and ftx and all of these uh, very shady uh, businesses but yeah i think you know that experience from 2014 is quite useful you know when you mention it now because it's it's uh, it's it's like that story of the three piglets who build their homes. Uh, one builds his home out of straws, and the other one builds it out of uh, sticks, I think, and then the other one builds it out of bricks. And then the bad wolf comes along and blows and destroys the two other houses, and only the brick house stays standing. And this is the bear market, bull market dynamic in the entire world of crypto. During the good times when Bitcoin is going up, um, all the people who are holding Bitcoin are very susceptible to all of these other insane ideas, like we're going <laughs> to get rid of corporations and the JPEG receipts are going to change the world and defy and ICOs and all that stuff. And so they start building all of these houses of straw and, you know, get yield on your Bitcoin. Just give us your Bitcoin and it's available for you anytime you want, but also we're going to give you a 5% bonus on it. And trust us, bro, it's safe and it's secure. All of these ideas thrive in the, in the bull market, but then the bear market comes along and, you know, the bad wolves of bear markets start to blow. And you see that all of these, all of this goes away. All of the, you know, the bad wolf just takes it all down. And the only thing left is Bitcoin. And Bitcoin continues to churn out a new block every 10 minutes, predictably, exactly like it said it would. And every 10 minutes, you're making the blockchain a little bit longer, a little bit bigger, and people are getting more security in it. And the production schedule is continuing as it is. And so, you know, when eventually the wolf tires of blowing with the bear market comes to an end, Bitcoin's production is going to drop by half, and then you're going to see the same cycle repeat again. So it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a bit lazy for people to just get angry and dismiss people because of their tone and ignore the real message there, which I think, you know, the, the best profit of that message continues, in my opinion, continues to be Matt Odell, his idea of just stay humble and stack sats, like just keep stacking sats. That's really the 
only winning strategy here because in the long term, that's the only house that's going to be left standing. Who knows what the hell else is going to happen? You know, the vast majority of the 21 other, 21,000 other digital currencies out there, the vast majority of them, 99.9% .9 have basically gone to zero in Bitcoin terms. And the only few that are left standing are likely not going to be standing for very long and you can't even count on them for whatever the hell they pretend to be doing so stacking sats is really the only um, the only uh, solid it, house i mean i you know i i almost don't even like to compare like bitcoin to, to other like crypto or digital currencies because they're just not even doing the same thing right B bitcoin is trying to be a new form of money so we should be comparing it with like money or stores of value right all this uh, uh, and, uh, and, you know, I, I almost see it as like a disservice, like these things are comparable to Bitcoin and therefore this could be the next, this could be the next Bitcoin. So you should look at these other things. Bitcoin is the lead. The other one, you know, I, it's, a, it's, it, this to me is a huge disservice to, to people in general, because people don't even understand completely what Bitcoin is. So it becomes easy for them to be susceptible to this concept of like, oh, something else can be the next Bitcoin, and it can be one of these other digital currencies or cryptocurrencies, which are, are just completely different things, right? You're talking about, you know, the the dollar versus Apple stock it makes no sense, right? P people are not are not saying, oh, the dollar is so massive, maybe Apple stock will overtake its its market capitalization, right? At some point, and really, you know, when, when I think about, you know, where Bitcoin should be, it should be on the chart that's looking at traditional stores of value, fiat currency, gold. These, these kinds of things and this is what we should be looking about uh, because this is where this is where where really bitcoin is, is acting as a challenger right and where it's really competing uh against the world and i think that 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 this 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 framework this 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 you know way of, of looking at things will will almost you know indirectly act as a form of education for people because People will be like, okay, why is it being compared in this way? What is it about Bitcoin that actually makes it a challenge to traditional currencies, to gold, right? And because, because really, you know, Bitcoin might be quote unquote king of digital currencies, but it's not king of money yet, right? And that's where we're trying to be. It's not like Bitcoin got there in 2022. It's not like Bitcoin got to its place that's supposed to be, or no, in 2020. It's not like, you know, it's more like, you know, maybe now Bitcoin is somewhat being looked seriously at as as a, a mean of exchange and store value where we actually have countries right uh like el salvador that are looking at it as legal tender right that's uh, and, and, and so you know I, I i hate i hate looking at it as bitcoin's number one and it's fighting to stay number one it's actually not number one it's you know i forget what what how it ranks among currencies but it's it's fighting to get to number one, you know, to, to sort of be the new US dollar, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think this is really the key battle. I mean, if you compare it to national currencies, Bitcoin, I think uh, maybe Thomas can uh, look this up, but there's a website, I think that uh, it's called Fiat Market Cap that compares the fiat currencies oh, to Bitcoin. Um, love it. Bit yeah, Bitcoin, I think is in the top 10, probably maybe top 15 or so. But really, I think in, in my mind, even the, the bigger prize than just national currencies, because few people actually use national currencies as their store of value, or more accurately, the people who have to use national currencies as their store of value are generally poor people, people who don't have access to financial uh, instruments, people who have serious wealth, they use government bonds. That's the jackpot for me. That's what I always mm. say in the fiat standard. I, I think of it as Bitcoin wins in my book when it is larger than uh, when it is larger than the global bond market. When people are saving more in Bitcoin than they are saving in bonds, and currently Bitcoin is at around 0.3 percent or so of the global bond market. So we still got a long way to go, uh, which you know, which is great news <laughs> if you're stacking sats because uh, it's still getting there. Oh, so Thomas looked it up. The fiat market cap, the Bitcoin is at number 28 now. Is that based on, uh, well, that's I think the broad money supply, probably not the uh, narrow money supply, but yeah. So yeah, it's the 28th largest currency, but yeah, we still got and, a way to go. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the interesting there, thing there is that, you know, Bitcoin will essentially become the most liquid uh, store value on on the planet when it gets there, right? Because if you, if you think about 
the liquidity of, of treasury bonds versus Bitcoin. With treasury bonds, it's not like you're able to spend it on Venmo or you know so on uh, with a credit card directly peer to peer digitally you know across the world and on exchanges right you just all you have all you really have are exchanges and maybe i think you can you can still get physical treasury bonds and maybe you can do like a physical paper exchange of that but besides Open that dimes, I, basically yeah yeah exactly uh, but but other than that i mean you can't go from treasury bond to breakfast right you, but you can do that with bitcoin so so the interesting thing is when we get to where we want to be Bitcoin will ultimately be this relatively stable asset, right? But because, you know, it's 21 million over infinity, it's, you know, absorbing global inflation uh, at, at a minimum. And so it's, it's growing in, in, at least, you know, nominally in value. But uh, so you have basically this, this in, incredibly riskless saving technology uh, where you can spend it easier than any of these other things. So, so it actually becomes, you know, uh, the downside is it probably becomes harder for people to like, you know, raise money for their for their for their startups or whatever because you need to provide mo- more value than you would just holding your money in in Bitcoin, right? You don't have this effect that like the inflationary dollar supply has. So at the end of the day, you get companies that are being built, but they need to be providing more value, so you get more valuable companies um, because people are are are. Val- Valuing the risk, do I want to, you know, uh, yeah. uh, spend my Bitcoin on, you know, this on on, on this on this high risk project or not? Um, so, uh, but but ultimately, I think this is good for for the consumer and, you know, the average everyday person who you know have savings technologies that doesn't cause them to slowly lose their money. Uh, all the time. Of course, I'm talking about dollars, right? So yeah, um, no, I, I agree with this entirely, and I think you know the. Uh, I mean, the, the the really money you could argue is actually government bonds, not so much the uh, pieces of paper and the fiat money that is in checking accounts. It's re- because what is money is the, money is the thing that is the most saleable, and at scale in large quantities. The thing that is the easiest to sell, the thing that is the easiest to hold currently is government bonds. So, you know, if you're Apple and you're going to sell a business or you need to buy a business, you know, you need to, they've got a, they've got a cash balance of maybe, uh, I think it's with Apple, it's in the tens of billions of dollars or maybe more than a hundred billion dollars in cash are their holdings like for Apple and Amazon. You're talking about more than $100 billion. They don't hold these in physical dollar bills and they don't hold them in a checking account. They hold it primarily in US treasuries because treasuries are the most liquid market. Because if you needed to get rid of $15 billion so that you could acquire a company, you need to, you know, you want to be able to sell those treasuries. It's the thing that is the most liquid. You can't really hold them in cash because cash loses its value. So you hold treasuries and treasuries are the thing that is the most saleable. In other words, you can take $15 billion and um, use them to buy that startup that you wanted to acquire. And you would suffer the least loss because you are going to be the you, you're, the market is big enough that it can absorb somebody like Apple or Amazon selling such an enormous quantity. That's what makes treasuries the most important form of money. But as you said, the, that limitation is that you can't just pay directly with the treasury. That's where they're inferior to uh, Bitcoin in that you can't just take the same sum. You have to still convert the treasuries into dollars first before you make the payment. And secondly, I think the other underrated point, which I make in the fiat standard, which I've heard nobody else make, is that the market for treasuries is not one fungible good. It's not like gold or Bitcoin, where one gram of gold is one gram of gold, or one Satoshi is one Satoshi, and they all are the same. With treasuries, it's very complicated. There there are um, 30 years of different maturities. So there's one month, and three months, and one year, and five years, and 10 years, and 30 years, and different issuance dates. And each one of these has a different price and a different uh, market. So even though the market overall for treasuries is around $24 trillion, it's not really a $24 trillion market because for your own treasury, you know, if, if you hold the five year, 
The five year is only a small chunk of that 24 million. And the five year at which your duration and um, issuance date is is also an even smaller chunk. So you're dealing with smaller chunks of the, of the $24 trillion. And that's where Bitcoin or gold would have an advantage. Obviously, the problem with gold is that uh, you can't use it for clearance without government institutions. And that's essentially how it was neutered. That, that, that's the advantage that Bitcoin has because you can spend Bitcoin all over the world. And that's really why I think this is kind of my very outlandish prediction in the fiat standard, which is Bitcoin is out there to eat the bond market. And I've not seen any kind of uh, uh, strong counter argument to it. So if any of our listeners uh, has one, please do write in. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is, this is obviously a very, a very interesting, uh, a very interesting outlook. I, re I recently heard, I recently heard a, a, a a, a theory, which is, you know, I think what the next halving is in 2024. And we typically you know, start seeing like the full effects of that about a year later with, you know, the effect of that going up, some sort of macro event also causing a, a you know, positive pressure. And then, you know, a, a, a media hype engine that just turns it into a bubble. You know, there, 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 there are some people who think that we're not yet, we have not yet felt the full effects of you know uh an incoming recession so perhaps what ends up happening is we hit this recessionary environment and it coincides at the same time as the halving and all of a sudden you end up having this natural price increase from the reduction of supply without a 50 percent reduction in sort of the demand right and that causes a price increase and what we end up seeing is these factors of like the whole market's going down, but Bitcoin is going up um, just as a result of these market dynamics. And the, what, what might end up happening is a massive bubble because people are looking at assets around the world. They're looking at where can I put my money? And they see Bitcoin as this asset that's, that's appreciating in this recessionary environment. You know, let's learn about this and let's get into it. So, you know, that, that, that's like a recipe for, you know, a, a massive multiple X bubble that yeah. really, you know, both provides education, but perhaps also, you know, will, will, will lead to also a big, a big crash afterwards. Yeah, I mean, uh, we, we're uh, a, a long running point we keep discussing here is how much is Bitcoin's price driven by its own dynamic, its own market dynamic versus uh, macro market dynamics. And, you know, so far, it's really um, abided very well with the kind of pattern you would expect. There was nothing else in the world, but it's just Bitcoin marching to its own tune, wherein you get a pump after the halving and then you get a dump after the pump and you end up at a price higher than where you were before the halving, and then you repeat again. A lot has happened over the last two years, but we still stuck to that pattern. And it's not really clear to me just how much each of these two has a uh, an influence. And so coming into the next halving, it seems highly likely but, but that by early 2024, um, Federal Reserve policy was, will have gone uh, expansionary. I mean, I think, you know, a lot of people can disagree about when they're going to stop tightening and when they're going to switch to easing. But I don't think it's likely that they will, you know, we, we'll get to July 2024 and they're still hiking rates. <laughs> so most likely monetary policy will have pivoted by that time. Um there's so many considerations which drive this. You know, the debt servicing cost of the U.S. just continues to rise. Interest rates are causing massive problems of solvency across the economy. All of this drives me to think that there must be a pivot between now and then. And so likely, <laughs> we're going to continue with this kind of, uh, we're not going to get a clear test where, you know, let's say we get a Bitcoin having coinciding with very strict tightening to see who's going to win. It seems so far we're getting more of the same kind of uh, dynamics where um, the having comes along with the expansionary policy and the post having crash comes along with the tightening. So we'll see. Well, well, I think it's important to mention, right? You know, we're, we're thinking about like the global Bitcoin market really as it, you know, with, with, with regards to how the US market is, is reacting. But, but actually, if, if you look, um, on a little bit more micro level, which is on a per country basis, we can see that the macroeconomic events on a per country basis have an effect, perhaps locally. 
So for instance, in Brazil, I think it was in 2016 or 17, the, the current president Lula was, was, was taken out of the government for, uh, uh, and indicted for, for corruption, right? And what we ended up seeing was that the price of Bitcoin in Brazil increased up to, I think, 20 or 25% above the global average. So we saw that more people were actually purchasing Bitcoin as a way to sort of protect themselves from the potential economic fallout of that event. If you go into, so as, at a similar time, 2016, uh, this one definitely happened in 20, 2016, in India, there was this de- demonetization event that occurred where the top two bills in circulation, I think it was like the 80 and the 100 rupee, were removed from circulation. And it caused a huge liquidity issue. You know, people just didn't have cash to buy things. People were waiting in line for hours every single day to go to the bank to get cash, right? And we saw Bitcoin rise as high as 40% higher than the global averages in India, right? Which, you know, again, kind of shows that people were reacting locally, in, you know, on a country basis based on like the country macro event. And that was having an impact on Bitcoin. I also like to I also like to think that before we get to 2017, which was the, that sort of peak in 2016, there was also the Brexit event and the China slowdown event. And if you actually look at how Bitcoin was reacting to these two events, we also were seeing we also were seeing you know slow price rises. This was actually on the macro level when Brexit was announced, when uh, and during the Chinese slowdown, we were seeing price appreciation during those times. As, as you say, you know, maybe the price appreciation would have just would have just happened. But if you look, but but just looking at the, the examples of like Brazil and India locally, we can at least see that on a, on a on a non-US country basis, it has effects on the local Bitcoin markets. And you can see those correlations during those two events. Again, this next bubble, the, the 2020 bubble, also coinciding with with COVID, right, and this whole sort of massive inflation shock, right, that that was occurring just because of the government printing so much money. I mean, it, it, it obviously is directly correlated to the price movements of Bitcoin during that time. Which one of the two is leading it? I think it's both. I think that they, I, th- I think that they, they, you know, are 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 have a, a synthesizing effect, right, where you have the natural effect of Bitcoin that then gets compounded by macroeconomic events. And then when these, once these two things grow enough and start getting media attention, that's when we start hitting, you know, hype and bubble levels. Yeah. So, yeah. And that's, and, and that's kind of just self-correcting. I think every time we get carried away and we think this time is different, that people start saying, yeah, that there's no coming back. Uh, you know, we had Michael Saylor saying it's going up forever. There's not going to be drawdowns. And you get uh, swept up in the mania. But I think the way that I think of it is that ultimately it's just Bitcoin becomes inflationary when the price rises. The uh, value of the new Bitcoin that's produced because the number of Bitcoin is fixed. The value of the new Bitcoin, the real world market value of the new Bitcoin that's being produced when the price rises keeps going up. And so Bitcoin is currently, you know, daily output is um, 900 coins at about $17,000 a coin. That's about... Uh, 15 and a half million dollars a day of new Bitcoin that needs to be absorbed by new buying pressure or else the price goes down. Well, at a price of 150 or a price of $170,000, you know, 10x where we are right now, then that's $150 million of new Bitcoin every day. And that's just a lot more selling pressure. So the, yeah, the, there is the mania where people get over leveraged and people go in um, and, and start buying Bitcoin with all the money that they have in quantities that they can't maintain, that they won't be able to buy with in a year or two. And then when that year or two comes in and all those people are, have you know spent all of the money that they would have been buying with, they need to sell because they need to pay off the credit because they bought on leverage. That's when um, you know the, the, the extra value can't the, the high price can't be maintained. So I think this dynamic is probably with us to stay. Although arguably it does get a little bit less pronounced every single time because the magnitude of the having effectively drops. You know we go from eight percent increase uh, to four percent to two percent to one percent. So with each one it's a little bit less. So perhaps we'll be getting smaller 
crashes and smaller spikes as well but who knows it's a, it's difficult to predict with anything like bitcoin it's well there's nothing like bitcoin but it is difficult to predict with bitcoin but anyways getting back to bitwage so yeah so we uh we went into the uh the lean years uh, the dark ages of 2014 and 2015 um sounds like not the ideal time to start your business but you kept at it and you kept going and how was business like in 2014 15 were there a lot of people beginning to get paid in bitcoin at that time yeah so so there were there were a good amount of people who were using our our b2c service that allows anyone to get you know any portion of their salary in bitcoin from any employer or any client whatever you know whatever you would get uber drivers and the drivers people from airbnb you know even like youtubers that were getting paid through our service and uh but uh, what was really interesting is that there was a group of people who were getting 100% of their salary in Bitcoin. And when we looked into them, they were all international. It was all people who were living abroad in like Latin America or East Asia and, or, or, or Europe, actually, who uh, were receiving their entire salary in Bitcoin. And then, you know, they weren't, keep, they weren't keeping it all in Bitcoin. They were using it as a mechanism to move money because, you know, getting, getting traditional wire transfers, they were losing like 10% and the money could get lost therefore taking two weeks to a month for them to get money. This is just a simpler, easier, and, and really cheaper way for them to do it. So we created a, a, a new side of the business that handles international international payroll, um, which is basically either companies paying workers abroad anywhere in the world, you know, leveraging Bitcoin as like this underlying mechanism to get money into their accounts, or the workers themselves signing up to do that. And so that really helped us grow um, Sort of before the 2017, uh, the 2017 bubble. Um, this was a very important market for us. And yeah, so you know, once we were kind of moving, for, not just on the investment side, but kind of like this utility, cross border payment, salary side of, of 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 the house. That's when we really started to to take off in those early years, and we were able to actually support ourselves as an organization because uh, before we raised money in 2015, I mean we. We almost ran out of money, you know. I mean, we were we were probably a few months away from 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 not having money anymore, and we got we got lucky uh, at the end of 2015. And uh, Tim Draper, uh, uh, among several other investors, uh, invested in kind of a, to a pre-seed round at that time, which was it, you know, uh, a godsend. It, kept, it enabled us to to keep going, get to sort of 2017, where that brought a huge huge new wave of clients for us going into that bear market. Uh, we hit profitability and then into 2020 where, you know, really the business started to take form as crypto payroll, you know, almost became accepted among, you know, uh, I guess the, the average everyday person, the average everyday HR company. Yeah. And uh, how, how, how is business going now? <laughs> yeah. So, so, so luckily business is going well. I mean, we have, so, you know, some of the great things about our product, we're, we're non-custodial. As you know, we direct deposit into, into any wallet that you provide to us. So we're not, we're not Actually, keeping you your know, money. Actually, walk us a little bit through the, um, through the process. I, maybe we should have done this at the beginning, but uh, <laughs> um, just how, how does it work? I know because I use it, but uh, in your words, that's probably better explanation. Yeah, so if you, if you want to get part of your salary, you know, in, in, in Bitcoin, you would sign up, you'd access to a depository account um, which you can either use invoice our invoicing technology to invoice your client and they pay into it, or you can connect it to like a payroll system or put it on your own invoicing tech. On the other side, that's how you get how the money comes into the system. The way that it comes out is you can add, you know, uh, several different Bitcoin wallets. Um, you can actually add like a, a a list of you know up to 100 different wallets that cycle through for greater for greater privacy. You know. Um, on on your deposit so you don't have like a recurring deposit into the same into the same wallet but basically you sign up you put in whatever wallet you want whether you want custodial non-custodial going to an exchange going to your ledger it all works and on payday you get paid the dollars get converted into whatever uh, into whatever percentage you want in bitcoin to go into your account whatever percentage you want into various fiats to go into your bank account um that's how it works on the B2B side, a company can sign up and invite all their workers, freelancers, employees, contractors, admins, uh, and there's a whole like invoice and expense management system to make it super easy. We integrate actually directly into 
the top 10 payroll services in the United States, such as like ADP and Trina and these kind of organizations. So you have no overhead. It's super little work. You can offer the benefit and pay people anywhere around the world, uh, basically a couple clicks in Bitcoin, however they want it without any sort of risk or liability of like them getting their salary in, you know, some shit coin like Luna or, you know, you recommending them to a wallet that ends up losing all their money. Yeah. And so basically you're non-custodial. You don't keep anybody's Bitcoin. You just uh, buy them Bitcoin and you send it to their wallet immediately. Exactly. And I think that this is, th this service is an important service because as regulations change, when you go to exchanges and you buy Bitcoin, uh, one of the problems that you're going to ultimately end up having is you have your money on this wallet on an exchange, right? And you want to withdraw to your non-custodial wallet because you, you've now upgraded to, 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 you know, wanting to, to be your own bank. Well, because from the exchange's perspective, this is an anonymous transaction. They're going to make it very hard for you to move that money because regulation is going to change. It's going to say, hey, we don't want you doing anonymous transactions out of your wallet, right? But if you're getting paid, your salary directly into this this you know non custodial wallet you're you're bypassing that step because we don't have an anonymous transaction occurring right here and we're doing we're doing small enough amounts that uh, you know the 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 requirements for doing a big transfer won't won't be there so what we see is that as regulations occur this will be the easiest way for you to actually get money deposited into your non custodial wallets and uh, sort of another fear that, 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 that I have out there is, you know, sometimes employers will partner with a particular wallet. Well, if you go down that path, you think, okay, every employer partners with whatever, with a different wallet. So you're a worker, you, you move to six different employers and you're getting your Bitcoin in like six different wallets. Two of those wallets don't even let you withdraw the money. So you get your money fragmented everywhere. It's a total, it's a terrible experience. Um, you don't know where your money is. With us, you would be able to have your one wallet and carry it around with whatever employer you go to. And we would essentially be enabling a much more interconnected world, right? Where no matter who you work for, no matter what work you do, you're going to get paid any percentage between Bitcoin and, and fiat into whatever wallet that you want. You know, and that's, that's, that's what we're, we're trying to build. Yeah. So what is the policy that you guys have in terms of uh, KYC? H how does KYC work with you with your service? Yeah. So I mean there we do we do KYC. So I mean you come on, you got to and so we have a so on the B2C product, um uh, we do more more KYC on the worker. What that basically means is we're we're getting more documentary information from the worker. If it's using the B2B product, it's on the company and the admins of the company. So the workers have, you know, a, a, a little bit more privacy as a result of that because we're, we're kind of relying on the KYC that we've done on the company. But yes, we work with banks. We work with, with, with financial institutions. We work with fiat. You work with fiat, you got to be doing KYC. If, if you're working with an organization that works with fiat, is not doing KYC, you know, you got, I, I, would, I would be a little bit worried uh, about, you know, the future of that particular organization because that's a highly risky thing for an organization that touches fiat to do. Yeah, basically the only way that you can... Um, I, mean, I think a lot of people have gotten burned from the idea that uh, they think uh, blockchain is... Uh, you, they think using the word blockchain is like... Uh, decentralization pixie dust and you just sprinkle it on your startup and then you don't have to tell anybody anything hey i'm doing blockchain um you know some shit coiners have gotten away with this <laughs> but a lot have not and i think the uh, reason is that uh, if you have an office if you have uh, a headquarters if you have a website and you have an about us page no amount of buzzwords can change the fact that you are a person and uh, you can be tracked down and your business can be shut down and your banking relationships can be shut down. So the only way that you can have things that are really uh, KYC free is if you're just dealing with Bitcoin only, um, you know, you're exchanging goods and services directly for Bitcoin, which I think, you know, people can do and people do extensively in, in the Bitcoin world. But realistically m m more and more of our economic transactions are in fiat world just because the majority of the world is on fiat and i think there's a there's a kind of um, 
there's a nice idea that you know it would be great if you just got paid in bitcoin and you only paid in bitcoin and some people like to f use the concept of let's have a circular a bitcoin circular economy and that sounds nice in principle but in reality you know the division of labor if you understand how the division of labor works you realize that there's only one circular economy in the world and that is the world economy that's ultimately what it comes down to. Like, if you're using a computer, I mean, maybe there are some circular economies other than the world economy, but they would be one small little island or one small tribe uh, that's completely isolated in the Amazon or somewhere. Um, but if you're, uh, if you have modern technology, if you have cars, if you have computers, then you're engaged in an extremely complex and sophisticated division of labor. You know, the only reason your computer can arrive to you is because. Um, you buy it from somebody who is buying it from the producer and that producer is buying goods and services uh, from thousands of employers and suppliers all over the world. And they in turn are buying and trading with thousands of others. So the notion that you can just, uh, let, let's find a computer seller who makes Bitcoin and let's find a, uh, let's find, you know, a car maker who takes Bitcoin it's far more complicated because you can't just carve out small, you know, all the things that I want to buy, let me just find people who sell them for Bitcoin. That doesn't really solve anything because those people are part of the global supply chain. They need to interact with the world at large. And so, you know, there's that beautiful article, um, like I called Leonard Reed, uh, it's called I Pencil. And it uh, explains how many people does it take to make a pencil. You think a pencil is a very simple thing. You can make one on your own, just get a little bit of wood and put a little bit of tiny eraser on the top and the graphite in the middle or whatever, and then it's done. But in reality, it's millions of people, an uncountably large number of people all over the world that have to cooperate in order to make a pencil happen. And that's why we're able to have so many pencils and have them at such affordable cost because it's all done with specialization, with a very large number of people interacting with one another. And they all, you know, they all work together. And uh, the reason that they all work together is because they use money and they specialize and they trade. And so, yeah, it would be great if everybody was on Bitcoin. But realistically, as long as Bitcoin is still only 0.5 or 0.2% of the global money supply, 99.5 to 99.8 percent of the world and the 19 and therefore 99.8 of your supply chain is not bitcoin based so you have to be dealing with people who are not bitcoin based and you have to be dealing with fiat services so then the question becomes how do you get around that um i think bitwage is useful in this regard because it minimizes your reliance on banking in a very real way particularly for people who travel this is, this is the thing that I find particularly useful for me because before I was using Bitwage, I constantly had to move money across borders uh, using the banking system. And that's just massively inconvenient because banks are just a pain to deal with. Um, with Bitwage, I just get the money in Bitcoin and then I move Bitcoin across borders and I liquidate the Bitcoin when I need to buy things in fiat rather than having to uh, move fiat across borders and then buy Bitcoin with the fiat. So it turns out to be a much more effective way because it reduces transaction costs significantly. Yeah, and you know, to to speak on sort of this this reduced reliance on banks. I mean, you you don't need to actually have a bank to 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 get paid through Bitwage, right? For pretty much, you know, all the other ways of acquiring Bitcoin, you need to actually have a bank account that you connect to a service, pulls the money out of the bank account, gets you the Bitcoin. But in our service, you, you actually don't need to have a bank account. I mean, this is like one of the few ways where you can actually get Bitcoin into the hand of someone who's unbanked or enable someone to unbank themselves, right? Because you just go in and your services are directly being deposited as Bitcoin into whatever wallet you want uh, without any reliance or connection from your side, at least, with with a bank. You know, I think that this is, this, this, this you know, I've always been very excited about this possibility of helping unbanked, of course, unbanked people of themselves been a bit uh, uh, averse to to Bitcoin because of the, the volatility, but um, the the technology itself is there. We enable it, and we and people do it every day to use it every day to unbank themselves. Yeah, I mean, if if you work outside the U.S. Uh, for somebody in the U.S., the um, pain in the ass that is involved with 
having them send you a wire transfer internationally is excruciating. It's just always uh, trouble. And your local bank, wherever you are, is usually having giving you trouble. I mean, I guess if you're in the U.S. and Canada, between the U.S. and Britain, it's not that big of a problem. But if you're somewhere in Latin America or the Middle East uh, or East Asia, m money transfers from the U.S. can be a big pain in the ass. And it can sometimes, you know, when you, when you count the fees and the time that you need to spend on processing it, sometimes you actually need to go and walk into the bank like a 19th century peasant and talk to somebody in order to get your money, which, you know, Bitcoin really makes that easier. But with Bitwage, they, your employer just needs to send the money to a US bank account, which arrives very quickly, sometimes in the same day. And then the Bitwage immediately makes a Bitcoin transaction and then you get it wherever you want. And then you can cash out the Bitcoin rather than having to take the fiat from the bank, cash it out and buy Bitcoin with it, and uh, you know, spend some of it and buy Bitcoin with the rest. Now you just keep the Bitcoin and spend uh, the amount that you need from the fiat that you want. And you convert to fiat and you spend from the fiat. And, and it's not just US actually, it can be, it can be from Europe. For, uh, we, we've got you know, uh, the ability to receive money in Europe, in the UK, in Canada as well. So you can have you know, employers and clients from, from, from many different geographies and jurisdictions um, and, and get paid in Bitcoin. Yeah. And you've also been working with a lot of athletes. Uh, how's that been going? What's the deal with the athletes? Why are they so much into Bitcoin? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, what a lot of athletes have been telling us is that, you know, their career is short. They might be making, you know, a, a large amount of money during that short career, but it's short. So they have to really think about the future of their money. And so a lot of these athletes, they say, okay, well, what, where can I put my money where, you know, I'm, I am, am saving my money. I uh, have a, have a considerable upside for, you know, not, not such a high amount of risk. Well, a lot of these guys, like they understand, they, they find out, they learn about Bitcoin. Actually, we, we, we use the Bitcoin standard uh, every single time when we're trying to educate uh, one of these, uh, one of our athletes. So we send them Bitcoin standard, we give them an education session, they come out and they'll be like, okay, yeah, this is really cool. You know, I want to have a portion of my salary in this so that I know that I'm saving my money for the future when I can no longer fight, no longer, you know, play soccer, no longer play football. And so we've got, we've got uh, people, we, 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 we've got professional athletes from all different kinds of sports, right? Professional football, professional soccer, uh, uh, MMA fighting. And um, just recently, Mateus Nicolau, I think he, he uh, became number five globally ranked for his, uh, for his division in the UFC. So congrats to him with his, his, his fight that just happened, I think it was last weekend. Um, but I find working with athletes to be almost like part of our education strategy. And, you know, it's not like working with athletes is a, is, is um, this big growth strategy where we're going to get all the athletes in the world to get paid in Bitcoin. No, it's actually about, these are very influential people that have a, a, a base of people that look up to them, that, that, that want to, to sort of do as they do. And we find that when we can work with athletes, um, they're able to then learn, understand about Bitcoin because we provide, you know, really high quality concierge services where we fly in person and educate them around the world so that they can properly educate the people that look up to them um, and, and, and show them it is possible to, you know, get part of your salary in Bitcoin. And, and this is why, you know, they do it. And why Bitcoin matters, right? And this is kind of how, how we uh, see that we're we're sort of educating, you know, people around the world on this on this subject, and that's why that's why we're working with with uh, with these athletes. Yeah. And how how was working with the companies? What is the experience that you get when you're trying to work with companies? Um, are, is it only Bitcoin companies that use you guys? Or um, do you get companies that are not Bitcoin based in other kinds of business and they also still want to do this? Yeah, we get a lot of average everyday businesses like IT services, like a lot of companies that are that have like outsourcing that are outsourcing companies like IT outsourcing, marketing outsourcing, real estate outsourcing, like all, all, all all these kind of like professional services firms essentially will will come to us and will use us because a lot of times they're working with contractors either around the world that need the cross-border component or 
you know, in the United States, but they need to have, you know, competitive benefits to keep them, you know, connected to their organization. So actually, like the Bitcoin and sort of the greater, you know, cryptocurrency industry is not, they're not, they're not our main customer base. You know, we do, we do service a lot of companies there, but actually, you know, 75% of the businesses that use us are, are not related to our industry at all. And they're doing, they're using it for, uh, uh, either the cross border payment use case of like, okay, let's not, you know, go, you know, send individually 15 wires every single day, right? Or not every single, every single month. Let's have a system that actually helps us do this in a way that's also going to be cheaper and easier to use at the end of the day. Um, or it's companies in the United States that are saying, hey, we need, you know, more benefits to retain, to hire, and we want to have access to benefits that cost us very little, but actually have some of the highest opt-in rates for voluntary benefits on the market. That's why we, that's what we do because we will typically see between 15 and 30% opt-in rate. Uh, even among, you know, very non-technically savvy focused organizations. You know, when we've done uh, surveys for, for cities that are looking to adopt this, we found that 20% of the people who respond to the surveys uh, said that they were interested in getting part of their salary in Bitcoin. Th- these are some of the reasons why people are adopting us. You know, of course, during the, during the bull market, we saw much more of the domestic use case. And now during this bear market, we're seeing much more of the cross-border, cross-border use case. Yeah. And do you guys uh, consider integrating Lightning yet or are you just all uh, on-chain? So we did, so we did a, a proof of concept uh, on Lightning, a Lightning payroll solution where we actually paid an athlete and the CEO of a, a Nigerian Bitcoin exchange their salaries on Bitcoin. And it was the first Lightning payroll uh, serviced by a third-party provider. You know, the cool thing about that is we were really working with, uh, at the limits of the Lightning Network. We didn't want to just open a, a, a channel directly. We wanted to go through um, sort of the Lightning Hub so that we went through the channels, uh, we had that experience, and then people could instantly spend that money that they got paid on Lightning with, you know, everyone else who's connected into the, like the main Lightning Network, right? And so... One of the one of the payments was so large that we were having all kinds of issues trying to get the money to the person because because uh, there was just you know not enough liquidity on the channels to get there. So we actually had to connect with the guys over who, who create the the Eclair the Eclair wallet. They helped us get enough liquidity in the channels so that we could pay the money through the hive mind, and then they could and then you know our athlete and our and our and our our Nigerian Bitcoin exchange. Uh, CEO could then spend it directly into the network. So that was a great learning experience. We actually still keep that node open as like a as like a service to the network. But uh, what we kind of realized is that there needs to be a lot built around the service to make sure that we have a really great experience with Lightning. Right? You know, it's it's not that easy to have like a passive payment into a wallet that you set up on the Lightning Network because of the invoicing mechanisms that there are. With recent advances in Lightning technology, uh, you know we're 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 working uh, hopefully something in 2023 to enable like a, a consumer level ready uh, Lightning payroll product. Nice, that's very good to hear. Uh, so you also use stable coins and you use other digital currencies. Uh, how do you see the breakdown? If you're able to share with us, like how does how does the uh, usage break down between Bitcoin, stable coins, and other digital currencies? Yeah, yeah. So um, what we see is in the United States, Bitcoin is like the main is the main thing. You know, we might see we basically don't see any stable coin usage in the United States, and we only so the other only other digital currency we have is Ethereum. That that that's it, and we don't we don't intend to offer anything other than that. And the, the main reason why we offer that particular coin is because our customers demand it from us. And it's been around for long enough that I at least believe it's not going to be a rug pull kind of, you know, Luna fiasco, right? So we were kind of forced to, to, to offer that. But but yeah, so that only represents maybe like 5% in, in, in the United States and the rest is, is, is 95. Abroad, we see a much greater mix between Bitcoin and stablecoin. So actually, you might see something like 30, 35% on Bitcoin on the international side, and then the rest would be stablecoins or fiat, fiat payouts for 
for that. And, you know, I think that that is mainly because, you know, people are not trying to have 100% of their salaries in Bitcoin in, in, in the global context, because as you were saying, people live in this fiat world. So they're basically getting Bitcoin as, you know, what they view as uh, what they, you know, for their long-term savings. And then the rest is, is in, is in, you know, something that they're going to spend faster. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That makes, uh, makes a lot of sense. I think, uh, yeah, nobody has any use for, uh, a stable coin in the U S where you have a checking account. It's places where you don't have a dollar's checking account where stable coins are very useful. I think this is, you know, we've hosted, uh, Paulo Arduino here before, and he's, uh, I think the one kind of blockchain use case other than Bitcoin that has grown on me and I can see is very useful as uh, stable coins. And I think, uh, you know, a lot of Bitcoiners don't like it. A lot of Bitcoiners say, well, it's bad. It's, uh, it should be Bitcoin only. But uh, what I say to that is, let he who is without a US dollar based checking account cast the first stone. <laughs> <laughs> if you have a US dollar based checking account, which I think most Bitcoiners still do, I mean, very, very few are radical enough to just live off of Bitcoin only. Um, and even if you do, I mean, it's really not really very doable. Uh, you're still going to need to use physical cash. Uh, you're going to need to be exchanging your Bitcoin for physical cash periodically. But other than that, everybody still uses a US dollar based bank account. And I think, you know, obviously you wouldn't want to leave serious money in a US dollar based bank account because the dollar itself is devaluing in the banks. Who knows when they start falling apart or when the FDIC can't cover them or when the Fed decides to give you a haircut. But, uh, you know, for day to day usages, I think. Uh, uh, the having something that's dollar based seems to be pretty compelling use for people all over the world. Yeah, I mean, the, the reality is that there's a lot more people in the world that want dollars than want Bitcoin. I mean, that's just that's that's just what it is. And there are a lot of people in the world that don't have access to dollars. The thing is, I, you know, I actually kind of see stable coins uh, as a uh, Trojan horse towards towards Bitcoin, right? Um, because there, 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 there are two main barriers to entry. To, to Bitcoin. One is, you know, volatility. And the other is public private key cryptography. You know, a lot of these services that give you access to Bitcoin, they're trying to say, don't learn about public private key cryptography, just get access to the volatility of Bitcoin, which, you know, I, I think almost defeats the purpose of, of, of Bitcoin. But the other route with stable coins, you actually get a lot of people who are learning about public private key cryptography to get access to, to, to essentially digital dollars. And the thing is, once you learn about public private key cryptography and it becomes easier for you to interact in that world and learn how you could become your own bank, once you get to the point where sort of the dollar, you know, crashes itself, because I think that eventually the dollar will crash itself, Bitcoin will be there and it'll just be a click away. And all of a sudden, Bitcoin will look stable to the dollar and you know public private key cryptography. And I think exactly. that, yeah, so, so I see that as, you know, the Trojan horse that, get, that, that secretly educates people on how to be their own bank for when the time comes that they actually need to be. Yeah, I agree entirely. I think uh, this is really the key idea that, uh, um, you know, for me and in the Bitcoin standard, I focus primarily on Bitcoin's monetary policy and compare it to the US dollar. And that is for me, the main advantage of Bitcoin, just how much superior it is as a form of hard money because of the difference in the supply growth rate. But there is another um, factor to it, which is public key cryptography, which is that the dollar is built on a system of essentially KYC. You have an account with, you, you don't actually ever send dollars. You keep your dollars with somebody and then that somebody debits and credits your account and the account of people that you wanna pay for. And um, whether that be through your bank or through an app like PayPal or whether it's through a central bank or whether it's through international central bank settlement mechanisms, you don't actually have dollars. You have an account based on your identity and what uh, the, operates that account is your ability to connect to it and prove that it is your identity. So you have a password, you have a checkbook, you have a credit card. All of these things are essentially identity-based um, forms of uh, identification in order to move the money, or I should say identity-based forms of money transfer, mm -hmm. whereas Bitcoin is cryptography-based. It's just you have the private key. If you have the private key, then you can spend. If you don't have the private key, you can't. And uh, the second one, obviously, cryptography scales much faster and much easier because 
the first one has to have some kind of manual oversight. You need to take people's identities and you need to take their passports and you need to make them um, identify who they are and you need to establish a system for them to be able to log on. But Bitcoin's mechanism is just much more scalable because it's just about cryptography. You know, you have the private key, you can move it. And I think this is inevitably going to be the future. And right now, you know, the demand for dollar has to be higher than Bitcoin because, uh, you know, it's a, it's it's a, money is a network good. So you want to be on the network that has more users. And clearly that is dollars today. And so the, for the majority of people, they need to conduct their trades in dollars. They get paid in dollars and they pay in dollars. But I believe in the long run, that's going to shift because it's going to be determined and heavily influenced by what happens with the value of the dollar continuing to decline because of inflationary monetary policy, while the value of Bitcoin continues to appreciate because of much less inflationary monetary policy, far fewer dollars being far fewer Bitcoins being created than uh, dollars. You know, I, th th there's a term that a lot of people like to to, talk, to say about Bitcoin that it's that it's censor censorship resistant, right? I like I like that term, um, but you know, uh, uh, an even more explicit way of saying it is actually it's military resistant, right? At the end of the day, the big difference about holding between holding your Bitcoin on your on your on your private key versus holding your money in your bank is that the executive team of the bank is coercible and they can be and and the military is able to coerce them. That creates risk on whether or not you're going to continue to have that money that you have in the bank now and in the future. Whereas on uh, on the Bitcoin blockchain, there's no there's no like organization that the military can go to to essentially take your money from you. They'd have to go to each individual person, know that they have the money and forcibly try to take the money, which is a, mu a much more expensive, a much harder uh, uh, approach than just going to a set of, I don't know, three executives at a bank uh, and doing the same thing. And this is, this is kind of the power here. And it's one of the powers that, you know, that, that, that uniquely Bitcoin has, right? Because of how diverse and distributed the network is globally, how many different participants that there are, and the privacy involved in the you know the various different participants that 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 are part of the organization makes it makes it militarily militarily resistant. And it's really the only the only or, um, organization that's truly had a test of of its resistance of censorship, not military, but 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 one, which was like the UASF event, right? Where you had a set of, of corporations, which could all be controlled by the military, trying to create a system that would turn Bitcoin into a less decentralized, a less censorship resistant system for it to scale, as opposed to the platform that now enables Lightning, right? And that set that organization lost. And what we now have is a much more decentralized, a much more censorship resistant system that's able to scale because of the Lightning Network. I think that that is, you know, a testament to how strong that is. Because if you were to think of, of the same thing happening on Ethereum, it wouldn't happen, right? I mean, the one organization, one organization got hacked on Ethereum and, and they literally rolled back the blockchain, right? That would never happen on Ethereum. It can't happen, and so you know it just it, it basically just shows that this is this is the only thing that can be a global currency, like a, 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 a sorry I should, I should rephrase that a not an apolitical global currency. It's the only thing that can be an apolitical global currency because if the dollar goes down and people are trying to figure out what should be the global currency that's being used, well, you know. Who, People might think, well, the euro is not necessarily that stable. The, the amount of countries that are involved might go away. You know, China's yuan is heavily manipulated. Maybe we want something that's apolitical, that is uh, a currency that is military resistant. And Bitcoin is that thing, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree entirely with this, obviously. So what are your plans for the future? Are you guys going to keep doing more of the same? Or do you see any kind of uh, pivot toward um, new products, new services? Um, you know, we, you mentioned Lightning, but do you see any other kind of uh, 
strategic shifts in the future? Yeah, I mean, right now we're really focusing on our international payroll business. This is where we're seeing, you know, a great deal of our growth right now. Like a lot of companies. So after after the whole COVID thing happened, remote work blew up and all of a sudden companies are now paying workers all over the world and they need services to help them pay the remote workers. And so what we're really focusing on right now is how do we continue to make really high quality features and functionality that help those organizations manage those workforces, you know, have an HR level component on it. So it saves them time, but also has the payment level component with Bitcoin, with stable coins so that people can get paid faster, cheaper, easier than with other, other systems that are out there. So, you know, that's what I'm excited about for the next couple of years. But, you know, at the end of the day, what I want to make sure uh, that we have is we have a system that enables anyone around the world to get paid in Bitcoin or, or stable coins into whatever wallet that they want from you know whoever whatever employer whatever client that they have and that's what we're that's what we're we're, we're going to continue to build towards fantastic well thank you so much for joining us Jonathan this has been uh, fantastic and thank you for all of the great work that you guys are doing at Bitwage and best of luck for you for the future keep at it yeah yeah thank you safe hopefully uh, we get to run each to each other at the next conference i hope so too cheers have a good day